Hi there again. This is Michael Depp, editor of TV News Check, and welcome to TV 2025, Monetizing the Future. It's my pleasure to be hosting day two of our two-day event, and there are three parts to today's program. We'll start in just a moment with a panel called the C-Suiters Guide to Capitalizing on the Cloud, and that'll be followed by the very cleverly named Earth, Wind, and Fireside Chat, Why Moving to the Cloud is Essential. Then after a short break, we'll be back with our annual interview with station group leaders on the state of the industry. I'm very pleased to have Hearst's Jordan Wortlieb, Fox's Jack Abernathy, and Gray's Pat LaPlatney for that discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge our event sponsors. They are Signal Infrastructure Group, The Weather Company, Bit Central, Bit Path, and One Media. Thanks to all of them for helping us present this virtual conference to you today. We are very, very interested in your own questions for our two panels today. So I want to encourage you to use the Q&A button on the Zoom interface to submit any questions you like at any point during the panels, and we will do our best to try to get those answered for you. We had lots of questions yesterday, and we hope to see lots more today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce TV News Check's contributing editor, Glenn Dixon, to introduce his panel for a C-Sweeter's Guide to Capitalizing on the Cloud. Glenn? Good afternoon, I'm Glenn Dixon. Uh, broadcasters have been eyeing the public cloud for several years as a way to achieve new efficiency and flexibility in workflows ranging from traditional functions like master control and news production to new requirements like the origination of next-gen TV broadcasts. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has only heightened their interest and has in fact accelerated the adoption of cloud technology in several key areas. Today we'll discuss the technological and financial implications of a move to the cloud with a panel of experts. Joining me are Joe Adelia, Director of Technology Projects for Hearst Television, Jeff Birch, VP of Engineering for the CBS owned stations, Bob Heskamp, EVP of Engineering for Warner Media. Mike Kralik, VP Technical Operations and Deputy CTO for Sinclair Broadcast Group. And Sam Peterson, GM of the Core Business Unit for Bit Central. Uh, as Michael mentioned, we'd like to make this experience as interactive as possible for the audience. Uh, so please use the Q&A function to ask questions of our panelists which we'll address towards the end of the session. Um, I'd like to start off with, uh, with, with Bob. Um, could you tell us you know, what broadcast workflows has Warner Media already moved to the cloud and what applications are you looking to transition next? Well, Glenn, thanks for having us today. Um, as part of our uh, HBO linear playback move to Atlanta out of, out of Hallpog, we moved our DR play out for all of our HBO channels to the cloud. And we're successfully operating uh, them there today. And the learning from that is really influence a lot, uh, influencing a lot of what we're doing going forward as it relates to the cloud and our strategy around play out. Um, the next set of moves are also related to a facility move. You know, I, I think it's, it's widely known that we've sold CNN Center and we're going to consolidate our production facilities at our uh, Turner campus in Atlanta, our Atlanta facilities at our Turner campus in Atlanta. And, you know, to avoid, you know, increasing our power and HVAC demands and, and uh, our really the safe space in that facility as we bring these, these, these teams together and all these, all these production facilities together, we're, uh, we're, we're uh, moving the systems that were as many of the systems that we can that will work and they are benefited by cloud to the cloud. And so that uh, we're in a number of POCs right now around, around play out. Uh, in, in fact, in Atlanta, for, for instance, uh, uh, CNN Center and the, and the Turner campus back each other up for play out. Um, and so one of the first things we have to do is we won't have a second site. So we'll do the same thing that we've done with HBO and move all of the channel, uh, all of our channel DRs to the cloud. And, of course, we'll have some complexities around news and sports when we do that. And so we're, th those systems are in POC. And uh, uh, as, we, as we also look at how we can uh, 
not just not just uh, safe space and power, but enable our teams to work, continue to work anywhere and have access to all of our video. We're looking at cloud-based uh, edit and post-production for news and sports, and, uh, and also moving our archives for news and sports to the cloud. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, you mentioned some, um, uh, you know, basically, uh, ownership changes as, as, as a driver for, um, for, for some of this move. Um, can you talk about what, what, um, what impact COVID-19 pandemic maybe had on your usage of the cloud for certain applications like editing, uh, you know, in your news properties, um, or did you use other tools to help you, um, navigate through the pandemic? Our, uh, our, our, our edit systems are already in the process of being virtualized and, you know, using uh, VDI, virtual desktop, and uh, our post-production uh, and graphic systems were as well. So we leveraged those virtualized systems and really transitioned pretty, well, much easier than we thought we would uh, to a work from home uh, situation. And, and you know, as, as far as it goes, Virtualization, VDI are really the first steps for moving these systems to the cloud. They proved uh, that we can. We proved that we can work in these situations. So really, it's it's moving the systems, the the uh, uh, the feeds, and making them work in the cloud is the next step. So I think we're we're well on the way, and the learnings we took from uh, you, you know leveraging these virtualized systems for work at home during COVID will really help us a lot as we transition those systems to the cloud. And just to clarify, Bob, were you talking about remote desktop software accessing on-premise hardware, or did you actually have some instances? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. accessing virtualized systems on-premise, on-prem, yes. Okay, okay. But I think, you know, point we had, we discussed on the prep calls, um, you know, if you can do that, then to virtualize that, make that an instance in the cloud, as opposed to a, a workstation on somebody's desk isn't really a big leap, Correct. That's, that is, that's absolutely correct. And when you think about it, you know, you, in, in the middle of the night, you never will have another dark edit suite in, in, in theory because you could just turn those off, right? And, and uh, you're not, you know, the, the way you invest and the way you would, uh, invest in technology is, 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 is definitely changing. And we're working with our businesses to support those changes. Right. Yeah. And you're not paying to air condition that dark edit suite. Exactly. Either. Exactly. Really. We're, we're, it, it cost avoidance on all the power we would have had to the, had to add to the tech, uh, Techwood campus, all the ramp up of HVAC and, and, and the space it would take up to take away from uh, people in production facilities. You know, okay, we'd, we'd rather have desks than racks, I think, at, at the end of the day. Right. Right. Get get more get more money out of desks. Right. Nice. People can sit down. Um, uh, you know, Jeff, can you talk about what workflows um, have the CBS stations moved to the cloud so far, and how does that compare to uh, what the CBS network is doing? Well, the network is far out in front of the stations right now. They're, the network is moving all of the, the Viacom output and all the CBS output to what they're calling the Cloud Control Center out in Long Island, which is a huge work in progress, and they still got a ways to go with that. Stations, I like to say we're standing on the edge of the cliff, about ready to take the jump. Uh, we've got a couple of POCs going with cloud archive so that I can put everything to a central repository with transcoders in the cloud. So it doesn't make a difference whose edit system I have at the station, but everybody can see what's in that bucket, reach in, use it and move it around at will. Uh, and then for those of you that are familiar with the CBSN product, Two of the stations are actually doing live production to, to air, if you will, in the cloud, whereas the rest of them still have traditional on-prem. And we're, we're looking at the pros and the cons of the two. We've, we broke the cloud already. We found things that it couldn't do. But you know, as time goes on and as, as the engineers work on it, we'll, we'll get past that. And my expectation is that we'll move all of that to the cloud at some point. Uh, you know, The holy grail is, full edit in the cloud and full production in the cloud. We're not there yet. We've got a ways to go. You know, I think, uh, I think everybody's in agreement that latency is still an issue and just the physical process of getting high-res content back and forth 
in real time is it's a challenge. It's, it's not there yet, but we expect it will get there. Thanks. How um how long have those uh, couple stations been doing, you know, live production to air out of the cloud for for CBSN? Uh, Sacramento is about six months out already, and Baltimore was launched last month. Okay. And and when you mentioned you broke it, um, do, do you care to share any uh, you know what what where where the cracks appeared? I guess. Oh and, sure know, sure. You know, part of the CBSM product is that ticker that runs across the bottom of the screen, and it's uh, it's got all kinds of live data that's being scraped from a multitude of different sources. The cloud can't reproduce that ticker yet. There is just mm -hmm. something in the way it processed the video where it's having a hard time. And so we thought, okay, we'll backdoor it. We were going to send the output of the cloud back to the station, insert the ticker back at the station, and then send that back to the cloud for distribution to the CDNs. Well, we broke it again because it, for some reason it didn't like what was happening to that video after we inserted the ticker. So it, it's a work in progress. Okay, fair, fair enough. And and are you getting good support from your your partners in the cloud in in um, you know troubleshooting these issues, or are you you know sort of on, on your own in 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 uh, figuring these things out? It, it, it's actually a three-pronged effort. It's the local engine, the TV engineers at the station. We've got the CBSI folks involved, and then we have the cloud provider involved as well. So between the three of them, they're kicking the tires trying to figure out where the issues are. But the really good thing is, you know, we can spool things up and spool things down at will. I don't have hardware, you know, as Bob said, laying on the ground, generating heat, using electricity that is going unused, and. The better part is I don't have to worry about that that email from the vendor that six weeks from now the OEM stops supporting that piece of equipment and now I'm on the hook to replace all of it again. Mm, yes, yeah, yeah. I know that we've we've discussed that and that and 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 updates in in depth in uh, in previous webinars and replacement is is never fun. Uh, well, uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, Mike. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how how much Sinclair is already using the cloud today, um, you know, across its properties, and, and how much more you can do, uh, you know, between the local stations, the uh, the regional sports networks, and Tennis Channel. Sure, thanks, Glenn. Um, we've uh, we've really made uh, I think we've made considerable efforts into getting into the cloud. We've got uh, our Diginets all running in play out in the out of the cloud. Um, we have some disaster recovery play out for the regional sports networks. Um, we have some play out for tennis channel uh, that is uh, sort of on demand. We spin it up and spin it down as we need for additional ATP events. Um, media management, um, a lot of our media management workflows are, are moving towards the cloud because of, um, I think we see some immediate value in, uh, in the storage model for, uh, for media management. So, um, so we've moved a lot um, and I'm not, I, I don't think that there's anything that is um, completely off limits for the cloud at this point. We're, we're making a lot of efforts to look at everything. Um, I think it really comes down to um, understanding your risk tolerance, understanding your disaster recovery strategies um, you know, the, we've been very protective of our broadcast quality um, and and RSN quality for a very long time. I don't think anyone wants, wants, wants to uh, wants to compromise that in the future. And so uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what does local survivability look like. We will break the cloud, as Jeff said. Um, we will uh, at some point break networks. Um, whether we like it or not, I mean, we design for red, blue, hit, hitless networks that still end up not hitless, right? We take hits. So um, it has definitely come down to, um, you know, the change management, the risk tolerance, uh, understanding the operational workflows, um, and using those points to really um, focus on, you know, first efforts into the cloud.
There's my problem with the cloud. I, I, I thought I unmuted myself and I hadn't. So there you go. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't last a minute. Um, you know, uh, we, we chatted about this a little bit before. Now you guys are aggressive in, in, in deploying the cloud where you can, but you've also had a couple major facility builds um, where you put a lot of new technology in, but it wasn't cloud-based. It was, you know, kind of on-premise based uh, for this first, it was, it was tennis channels, new facility. And then you had to, again, another one of these uh, ownership changes where you had to, to move the RSNs um, from, uh, you know, from Texas to Atlanta and create a new center there. Can you talk about, you know, the, the, the thought press process behind that, you know, um, what your technology options were for those two places, you know, based on what the cloud can do versus SMPTE 2110 and good old HDSDI. Yeah, I think it's, you know, for both, both of those, uh, I, I still feel that we're, you know, we're early edge of, of cloud deployments for, for those types of facilities. Um, the most important thing with the, uh, with the RSN move was to sort of do no harm. Um, make sure we were apples to apples from a you know quality perspective um, for our master control, and so um, so it didn't pass a lot of the things I said earlier. Some of the change management tasks um, would have been uh, a, a bit too difficult for the time frame we were working in. Um, some of the risk tolerance questions weren't answered. I did say um, the one thing we we have done is you know uh, use the public cloud for some disaster recovery for that. For that new facility, um, but but that's it, it's really been a matter of of understanding, um, you know, where we can make uh, where we can make efforts that minimize uh, minimize risk um, and and maximize the value from the transformation that that cloud brings. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, and it occurs to me, you know, the RSNs you were doing a whole rebrand uh, as part of that move. So imagine if the ticker didn't work. You know that would that would uh that would not be not be good for anyone. Um, yeah, uh, Joe, can can you talk a little bit about um yeah you know, how Hearst Television uh, has been using the cloud to aid its workflows, you know, particularly in uh, in news production. Thanks, Glenn. Happy to be here today. Um, so sp specifically uh, around news, uh, asset management has been our our biggest uh, usage of the cloud and. We have today what we've called for years a distributed cloud, if you will, um, which allows for, um, for sharing of content between sites, ingest and export of assets uh, within local markets, et cetera. Um, so the architecture is kind of interesting, whereas the, the database, the metadata proxies are all hosted in the cloud, but the high res has traditionally lived uh, on-prem or on site. And when we share a high-res asset, it moves peer to peer, um, and it, it's it's worked quite well. And it's been kind of like I said, it, it is cloud in you know distributed nature, but there's an obvious view here of the the future where this will all eventually be be living you know in a repository in the cloud, and and all the files will directly transfer from cloud to ground. Um, and, and you know, and that's all part of the planning cycle, and something that uh, that will certainly happen, right? It's evolution here, and uh, in the next iteration of of when we when we upgrade the, to the next version of the the asset manager, uh, that will certainly be a resonant uh, piece of it. Um, the other large um, item we've been doing for almost eight years is uh, maybe even more is uh, archiving to the cloud, and this has been just the way to go for us when we move to file-based workflow, we realized very quickly that spinning a disk on-prem or trying to entertain any type of LTO or other type of tape backup environment was just going to be a, a big animal to deal with times every local entity. So it didn't make sense. So we we set out with our with our technology provider to uh, to create a you know a cloud-based solution for the for the news archive. And we created a, a pretty stringent SLA, which I'll add is is five to eight minutes for restoration. And quite honestly, we've met that SLA consistently for for the whole period of time that we've had this uh, in play, which has been been quite quite good. And and the other thing to to think about here is that when we crafted this originally, we kind of had the foresight to build this as a service. So it's archive as a service essentially. 
And I think that's the 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 key takeaway. I think as we'll we'll drill down through today for the next uh, you know 40 minutes or so. And I think that'll be the underlying theme here is that we're talking cloud, but really where the world is headed is is to to a service. And that's something that um, you know we've been early on in with archive and we'll see more uh, coming coming into the future. And it, it even lends itself into the storage paradigm, right? So today um, there's storage providers who are, you know, it's a, it's a license fee, right? You, you can buy on-prem hardware if you want, you can put your storage solution on it, your file system, and then there's immediate hooks into AWS or Azure or wherever you want to go. Where this is interesting to us for news is for overflow. I mean, you you never have enough storage on prem. News never has enough. It's just the way it is. You buy 100 terabytes, they need 110. You know, it's just the way the way it goes. Well, now with being able to attach to the cloud and doing this as a a service and having the scalability of the cloud, you can essentially overflow the bucket all you want. And you know, from a from a business and cost model. Well, the local station gets the invoice, right? And they see what they're spending, and you know they essentially have to clean out the fridge, so to speak. You know, so it, it, it's really a, a very interesting model that we're exploring going forward, um, which I think is is really helping us uh, not, not only today but also learn for the future on how these you know service models really play you know into the existing model and how we migrate migrate toward them. You know, a traditional you know, capital intensive business is now moving to the other other side of the balance sheet. And, you know, we have to do that gently and with a with a good plan and a methodical approach. And I think that we've gone through a lot of learning experience over the last years that are helping us uh, helping us get there. Um, you know, e even along the lines, for example, of, um, of VDI, you know, and Bob mentioned this, it's something I think that we all jumped into with both feet over the pandemic where we had to get remote control somehow. We had to create these these instances for people to work. Well, BDI today is is if you look at it and you kind of step back from the emergency case of the pandemic and look at a long term view, it's expensive, right? So you know, what we have to do is is really look where V and, and plan where BDI fits into our future. But the number one item, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say this, that all of this is it's all about security these days. And how can we secure these assets? How can we secure these desktops? BDI is very helpful there. All of these cloud cloud functions allow us to take another look at who has access, how they have access, the credentials involved. So, you know, security is also top of mind in anything that we're doing today. Thanks. Yeah, and I mean, you know, the notion you, you um, mentioned of adding storage. You know, you can think of it as if a a local station has a, a busy news cycle, whether it's a weather event or it's an elec election cycle or whatever. Um, you know, it's kind of the equivalent of bringing in a bunch of mobile production trucks for a sporting event that come in and provide extra horsepower, cameras, whatever, and then go away. So you can add a lot of storage for editing yeah. or, or um, sh content sharing across your group or whatever, and then spin it down. Um, very, very, very true. Very, very valid use case too. Special events are one, but you know what you know, we win in local news it's what we do and we don't we want to make sure our stations have all the resources they need to compete locally you know and to and to be first and you know to, to have something as simple as scalable storage removes that burden of concern and to leverage the cloud to do it is a pretty logical way these days to pull it off okay thanks yeah and and, and you know we may uh, drill down a little more into some of the cost considerations of storage and different kinds of, of content well, I wanted to, um, you know, give give Sam a, a chance to weigh in. You know, what are you seeing from your customers in using the cloud for for news production workflows, and has that, um, you know, shifted at all in the last year, year and a half because of the pandemic and the emphasis on uh, on being remote? Yeah, thanks, Glenn, and thanks for having us here today. It's, uh, I, I'd say we've seen a shift in usage. Uh, Primarily just in the quantity of usage, but you know, as Joe mentioned, and uh, we've got projects, you know, with with Hearst and with, with others where we've, you know, put these pieces in place, you know, a decade ago to allow, you know, this type of thing, and you know, we've migrated more and more, particularly as it relates to creating flexibility for customers. But certainly in the last year and a half, we've seen the usage of those tools that have been used on occasion before really go up. Uh, particularly sharing content distribution is one real key piece for us. 
uh, with our Oasis product and being able to share content between sites. And that is facilitated through a cloud architecture that we built out you know, some time ago. But looking at that usage, particularly March of last year, uh, and Joe's got the numbers to show, you know, it, with his team, you know, doubled, you know, almost tripled, you know, overnight. Uh, fortunately, it was something that many of our customers were used to doing, just not necessarily to the level that they did. But distribution, having flexibility, and, you know, I love the, the comment, you know, being prepared in a collaborative environment on the security piece, that's something that people got really more concerned about knowing that, you know, those connections were not just coming from inside the station. They were coming from people sitting at home, not knowing where that connection was coming from. So making sure that we had architected it correctly and going back and doing those reviews with our customers has been really important over the last 18 months. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, and Joe, I, I wanted to circle back. You know, you mentioned your archive application. I know, our, um, Archiving is something that that Mike has said makes you know financial sense to to do in the cloud uh, you know versus some other things. Um, what is what's your usage? I guess what percentage of content historically do you wind up accessing? Uh, you know that's in your archive. That's, that's got to figure out whether question. it works or not, right? That, that, that's a great question, right? So um, uh, so I'll put it this way: pre-pandemic. I would answer that as three percent, right? Of what we what we go deep into the into the archive, right? And this is cold storage, right? It would be three percent. The challenge is, is we don't know what three percent, right? So you have to archive everything. So that that's one of the challenges. It, it, throughout the the pandemic, uh, that's increased, right? We we've, we've actually gone gone deeper, and the the stats that I see are almost double that. Uh, going again, this is cold storage going in deep to older older content, you know, and, you know, the, the point of delineation I make is that if, it, if it's, you know, 90 to 120 days, I don't really consider that as deep archive, right? That's still a working story pretty much. So if it's deeper than 120 days, that's the kind of thing that we're seeing that we're going in for about 6% of the library, um, you know, for, for each station. And that's, and again, the library goes back to, you know, eight to 10 years. Um, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's valuable, right? We, we pull out a lot from it. The other thing that we're involved in now is actually going into our tape archives. And this is being spearheaded by our, our digital team. And we're, we're taking the tape. The first good part of it is preservation, right? Because tape is aging. There's only, there's going to be a certain point where, you know, in a local television station, you're going to have to make a decision of how long you can really keep this, you know, these tape archives alive. So we're trying to get ahead of that curve first is to try to preserve it. But secondly, we're using a, a, a pretty healthy dose of AI and ML to actually examine what are on these tapes. And then what's good is we're committing back into the, into the deep archive. And then with an API connection out to our digital tools and CMS, we're able to, to query in. And, and if there's a particular common campaign that we want to push on the digital side, or if there's even something that we want to do some digital originals with, we can we can dig deep into across the entire station group of, of archive, because that's another um, item we have available to us in our technology is that we can do, uh, a station can do a search for just their own market, or they can do a search across the entire enterprise. So if there's something common, we can find it, uh, you know, it all, all through all of Hearst Television. Or if there's something, hey, I, I'm just concerned about something specific in my, you know, backyard, you can do that as well. And um, you know, it's it's proven to be very valuable. But the, uh, you know, we'll we'll see, you know, when we we finally when the fog finally lifts and we get out of the the COVID, we'll see where our archive numbers go back to. But I think this particular use case of of digitizing the the, the old content on tape and trying to find a longer tail of it. I think that's going to be, be very interesting to watch. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And, and, you know, Mike, when you look at archive, how, how are you calculating your usage and um, you know, did that go up any during, I, I kind of know the answer to this question a little bit, but, but yeah, you know, across your different properties, uh, did you start using the archive differently in the last, uh, the last year? We, yeah, obviously we have, we've, we've used a lot of it. We, we ended up moving the eight, eight, nine petabytes of, uh, of content from the, uh, the previous RSN facility, um, all the way in, out into AWS. 
Um, so big move there, um, but part of a strategy to take um, take all of our archives to cloud over time. Um, some of the stations are still on their LTO libraries, um, but those are going to get phased out. They'll get moved to the cloud. The, the key thing for us is, is capturing the right metadata in the process of, of getting things to the cloud, making sure these things, the, uh, the archives are, are searchable, that we can um, retrieve the content quickly. Um, we want to make it intuitive. I think it's, it's important that as we transfer to cloud, we're not just transferring to cloud, we're transforming how media management is done at, at Sinclair, that, um, that we're improving the process, um, not, just, not just changing the technology used. Okay, thanks. And, you know, Bob, I, I seem to remember that Warner Media had a big initiative about archiving, I believe, trying to trying to come up with a common common metadata scheme across all your content, which just sounds like a mind bogglingly um, ambitious goal, considering all the stuff you guys have. But, yeah, can you talk a little bit about what you guys are doing with archive and how that dovetails with the, um, you know, the properties you, you uh, you're responsible for? In my, in my area's responsibility, uh, it, we're, we're really focused on, on the news and sports archive. Now there's a big project at Warner Brothers. Uh, I, I'm not directly involved with that. Um, but uh, as far as the news and sports archives go, we, we are uh, in the process of, of moving, you know, transferring those, those to the cloud. Again, it's a space issue. It makes sense. It's a, it's a uh, uh, availability issue. As Joe said, most of our stuff, we go, we go get in the first two to three months. And then we use for storytelling as big stories and anniversaries of key events, those kind of things come up. But we, we or, or if our affiliates uh, need, that, need that content for something, we help uh, provide our archive content to them. But uh, we're, we are in the process and we've done a pretty good job across those properties, news and sports, getting our, our metadata aligned and getting in and uh, allowing that, to, that content to move to the cloud in a pretty, pretty seamless way. And again, the process has just started and, and, and our timeline uh, to get it all in, our on-prem content has to do with really our, our, our dates uh, that we have to be out of CNN Center. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, we had, uh, my, my next question was, uh, was gonna be about, um, you know, uh, I guess how, how concerned people are about relying on a third technology platform for your core broadcast functions and we actually have an audience question which kind of asks this in a more colorful way and i uh, i'll I think i'll throw this one to, to jeff first and let you guys other people take a stab at it but the question is is the man for quality too high in old times when 50 million reviewing a major network an outage is a big deal today it's not clear that hiccups are as big a deal i see hiccups all the time anyway when Fox had that World Series event of dark time for three minutes a few years back, no one was fired in the end. Not sure in our fragmented universe it matters as much as it once did. True. Um, so, I, you know, Jeff, I'll let you take a stab at, uh, you know, that notion of how, um, uh, you know, what importance you put on, on, on being on air all the time and how that relates to. Obviously, you haven't spoken to my new management. Uh, I listen, I grew, I grew up from the school. One second of dead air or black was not acceptable. And we still maintain that mantra across the group. Yes, we all have outages. Yes, people live to see another day, but it's still not acceptable. The goal is 100% at 100% 100 of the time and nothing less. Doesn't mean we don't have issues, but doesn't make it any more or less acceptable. We we want perfection. Yeah, and you know, a, a follow up to that: do, do you think you do you need to have a multi cloud strategy? You know, with with different vendors, different platforms to have true redundancy. Yeah, I I don't think there's a person listening or watching that hasn't experienced backhoe fade at some point in their career or satellite outage. So to be riding on a third party path to get to all of my assets or to some of my processing doesn't sit totally comfortably. So, you know, Joe pointed this out in the pre-call, you've really got to engineer your paths from point A to point B with a lot more 
thoroughness and detail. You can't just rely on the vendor saying, oh, don't worry, you've got diversity. When you find out that the two diverse paths come together in the same conduit to go over a bridge somewhere. And, and it's happened. I mean, I think we've all lived through that. So yes, you, you've got to have multi-vendor relationships and perhaps even multi-cloud relationships to protect the, the assets integrity. And I, and I think the good news about about that is that there are solutions that are now becoming available that allow you to, to do that, you know, again, as a service, but to connect multiple clouds, to connect multiple LAN or WAN type technologies together, you know, there, there are solutions that are being presented today that make a lot of sense. And yeah, you know, I'll, I'll say it again, it's that last mile, that connectivity, that's, that's critical. You know, and, and that's what we're really doing here is that we're putting the weight of our entire operation on that connectivity. So to make sure that you it's done right, it's architected right, it's you know, multi uh, access, all of the things that you could think about. Yes, check all the boxes would be the advice that I could offer there. It says, uh, you know, that's number one. If you're still looping, you know, if there's still something critical going on in that in that facility, your connectivity needs to be as robust as you can possibly make it or afford. Thanks. Uh, you know, Bob, uh, would you mind weighing in on this? I mean, you probably have in order of more properties being transmitted via cloud than anyone though, you know, Vicom CBS looks like they're trying to catch up fast, but, but, you know, can you, can you talk to this, this issue of uh, reliability? Yeah, I'm not sure we have the most, but, but yeah, I think the design of the network, the design of your WAN, the design of your fiber infrastructure and your connectivity and your and your and your path to your direct connects is 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 as important as anything in your facility. I mean, I, I we've 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 learned that the hard way in some instances, but uh, when we've had network failures or, or things that, that 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 can grind production to the halt if it's not to a halt if it's not if it's not designed correctly and and. Uh, I think I, I think that, that that point is well taken. That our WAN, our connection between our facilities, our big production facilities in New York, Atlanta, Washington, and Burbank, it, 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 it's hypercritical, and and we spend a lot of time and a lot of resource on it. Yeah, I, I would add too that you know I, I'm always proud to say that Hearst has got the best people in the business, and I'm proud to be part of the team. But it's the team that makes it, and the investment in the team, an investment into experts even on the technology to have in-house is something that we find incredibly invaluable. Like we have LAN, LAN WAN experts, firewall experts, security experts on staff in, in Hearst, as well as a whole team that manages our, our cloud resources to, again, to the expert level. Um, and we have those at our, our disposal. It's, it's, a, it's a Hearst Corporation uh, technology services um, piece for for us, but it it definitely um, is available to all of television. So we leverage that expertise, and then we match that expertise up against the provider. So we we have our in house expertise, and the provider can bring theirs, and then we can really filter through. If you get my drift, you know what the right what the right solution is, and really what what we're being uh, what we're, what's being proposed to us. Thanks. Um yeah, this, we are talking about capitalizing on the cloud, um, so this may may come out of left field. But do, does private cloud, in any way, shape, or form, does that make sense as part of your uh, disaster recovery strategy? But uh, Mike or Bob, if you want to take take a stab at that, I was going to say that with with our multiple facilities, what well, we've kind of tried to aim to do is have them back each other up. And so that is part of our DR strategy. We kind of think of the way we, we edit, we record, we produce content and the, and the equipment we have in these facilities. And as we're re rebuilding our Washington one, we architect them so that we can share resources across the facilities or, or go to uh, a, a different city if we have, if we have an issue. And it's not only a DR thing for us. I think our, our goal is to be able to pool those resources, as somebody mentioned before, with special events or you need more graphics channels, you need more play out channels. You can pool resources for a big event in news or sports or, or production, a tentpole event in entertainment that uh, you, you just need more than you, you generally have. And again, it's, 
it's it's much like the cloud instead of having uh, stuff sitting idle for your worst case scenario you can pool resources and and add to productions where you have the opportunity to do so and we and we're, we're architecting towards that goal as we move forward with building new facilities yeah i think uh, to add on there bob's right i mean it, it is about a lot about centralization with private cloud and bringing the pieces together um, I've also seen um, some vendors now that are doing a consumption model for uh, for hardware in in a private cloud environment. So you can get some of those, uh, you know, timed time based use um, consumption models that that work on public cloud in a private cloud. I think going back to the network conversation, though, and Joe's comments earlier, um, it, it, it does come back to the network, though, um, the local survivability of of this is uh, is still key, and even if you're running a, a couple of private clouds, that that's uh, still as relevant as it is if you were in public. Yeah, and I think the challenge with a with a private cloud for a data center, you know, if you're going to set this up separately for DR, there's a lot to be concerned about. So think about play out for a minute, and think about local television. And if we were to have a DR center, we would have to have every network present in there, right, to be able to pass it through. We would have to have every, you know, commercial asset, every local promo, all the syndication. So to stand all that up kind of gets gets pretty interesting. Um, and I will say that we do it today. We actually do it at one of our, our stations, which is technically, uh, you know, a private data center, right? It's our own, it's our own private cloud, if you will, but it is stood up in one of our facilities. There, we did it because we've done it for many years and it evolved, you know, ultimately this will have to move out. And that's actually a big, big conversation that's, that's on the horizon for us is where do we move it to? And the, the private data center is one of those options. Um, but also an alternate cloud comes into play. Like we don't do a, like television doesn't do a lot, a lot with Oracle, for example, and does Oracle become the, the DR cloud, right? Where we do, we use, Azure GPS and, and, and AWS for everything else, you know? And I think that's the kind of things you have to, to start to think about is that maybe you don't need to own it, but you do need to separate it, create all that that resources there and assets there. And, and then the, the biggest challenge is managing it, right? Is that make sure the content doesn't go stale and is constantly refreshed. And so to, to just have the facility is only a small fraction of it, right? It, it's how do you manage this when it's not under your nose, I think is what you have to start thinking about. Thanks, yeah. And, and, and maybe you manage to get a better price too, if you have a, a <laughs> more more players in the mix, you know, and do that on my cable provider. Um, uh, Sam, what, what do you tell customers, uh, you know, about handling DR in the cloud and, and, and backups and, um, you know, are you seeing their thinking on that change, you know, or are people more comfortable with running more on public cloud platforms versus before? That's exactly the word that I would use, Gwen. There, there is more comfort today. There's more confidence in that. And, you know, as a technology vendor, what are we doing to help not just be the comfortable with the technological part of it, but also the operational part. So what are we doing from a user interface perspective and the back end? to make it seamless between what's being used on-prem to what's being used in the cloud. And that's why we've been really focused as have other vendors in the space to have you know real parity between the products and have the operational usage look the same, have the model you know be the same so that that is seamless between those two systems. So we've worked on you know business continuity you know programs for you know several customers, including you know a couple on this calls where you know, the, the end user doesn't know the difference between where they're pulling the content from. And so, you know, helping our customers just use the cloud is just, it's just one other asset in their mix and have that be seamless. User doesn't know, user doesn't need to know. And for us really to manage that operational complexity for them. So it really is just a, a question of the flexibility that we can provide, particularly as it relates to scaling and business continuity and DR so that that just happens. It just happens. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, and I just like to remind the audience, we have about five minutes to, to um, our, our session left. And so if you have some some questions on the cloud, we've got a lot of brain power here that's, uh, that's available. Um, so uh, you know, don't get them in at 149. Uh, but you know, I like to, to, to circle back with um, 
with, with, with Jeff, how are you seeing, um, you know, we talked about people charging differently for this or, you know, different models. How are you seeing traditional broadcast vendors adapt to the cloud and, and the new workflows? And are you, are you working with any new players, you know, at, within a CBS station group that you weren't a couple years ago because of your early moves in the cloud? I think, I think all the vendors are beginning, if not already into the cloud part of their world. Uh, you know, now I call up any particular vendor and I, I want to buy a system. It, they're not ready to sell me hardware to go in the plant right out of the gate. There's always, would you prefer to put it in the cloud? So I think all the vendors are, are getting there and, and addressing that part of it. Uh, but, you know, as was pointed out, you're now moving your cost from the capital column to the operating expense column, which is a huge conversation to have with the finance people. Because now you're not depreciating an asset over 10, 12 years, you're paying for it this year. And it goes straight to the bottom line of the P&L. So it, it, it put everything in a whole different light. And we've got to address that as, as we move it forward. The other point I want to bring up, and it's, this is not a criticism of the cloud, but you're putting all of your assets now out in this third party entity, what happens come the divorce? You'll sign a contract for five, six, maybe 10 years for the cloud storage. Then that contract expires. What happens if you can't come to an agreement? What do you do with all of that material that's now out there? Where are you gonna put it? How are you gonna get it back? So these are all things that you need to consider upfront so that it doesn't become a crisis on the back end. Yeah, negotiate the egress up front. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and by the way, egress is not free. No. You know, they, they, they almost give away the storage part of it, but the retrieval piece, and depending on how fast you want it retrieved, there's a price tag attached to that. And it doesn't go away. Every time you go get something, the, the register is ticking away. Yeah, I, I think the other thing that you have to think about in the in the context of, of vendors, we we refer to our vendors as partners, first of all, because we're in this together. And the existing set of broadcast partners um, have a certain amount of IP around what we do, right? And how our business works and the real time nature, especially of local television, right? And there's the, where we fully welcome anyone new to the space with new ideas and want to get into the partner space, we are very, very happy to, to speak to anyone with open arms. Um, but we have to also recognize that some of the, the, the our, our partners who have been around a while know our business really well. They know our pain points, they know our challenges, and they understand real-time TV. And I and I think the there's a quite a few, if not, I, I dare to say all, but there's quite a few that are taking that IP and taking it with them to the cloud exercises and bringing them out and, and really solving for what are real world situations as opposed to just coming to us, knocking on the door and saying, hey, we're the latest cloud play out provider, come, come buy from us, you know? And you know, we're, we're more apt to say, hey, partner, show us what you have because you know what we do. You know? So I think that's kind of a differentiation a little bit anyway. Of, of the space right now is that, again, we're not, a, not afraid or certainly don't close the door on, on anyone coming in new, but we do have to recognize that the, the, the players who have been with us a long time really know our business. Yeah, that's fair. Um, well, hey, I, we have one, one more question from the audience and I try to try to get it in. Uh, this person says, I'd love a 30 minute show featuring the various local sports wrap up from four to five major cities in California. There must be affiliated stations. Maybe this is a gambler. There must be affiliated stations in a state that could produce such a thing for me. What are the blockers to that kind of innovation on the programming side? And they reference all we've been saying about how it's easy to spin up a new cloud play out and experiment with such a channel. So, you know, broadcasters, uh, you know, what's the viability of something like that? Is that as easy as it sounds? First, you got to see what the business model is. You know, it, it's got to make money or we're not going there. Now, if we were if we were tasked with with the the exercise, you know, with the job, you know, we would certainly find a way to do it. And quite honestly, we have a tremendous amount of resources today. Like every one of our stations are connected real time, 
right? We could share real-time video with extremely low latency today. We can move a file from any site to any site and play out. So all of those resources are there. We would just have to know what the what the exercise was. And then also the, the bigger question is, is that where, you, where is this going to originate from? So you have all of this content you're going to bring in, but then how are you going to turn it around and from where? You know, and, you know, maybe it, you could say it's the cloud, but still on a local basis, it still needs a local home, you know, and I think all of that needs to be crafted, as Jeff said, in a business model. Uh, but technically, you know, most groups are there already. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, and that was, sounds like something that would maybe be a perfect fit for um, next gen TV, right? Isn't yeah. that the, the idea using the cloud to create new, new programming? models and insert yeah, targeted ads. There are tremendous amount of advantages coming up for next gen TV and the cloud is going to be a major component of next gen. You know, it's, it's an IT stack as it is today. So to move the next gen stack to the cloud is not a heavy lift. It's uh, again, I think it does come down to the, to the, the business side and to find that, that app that we want to do. And uh, we can certainly make it happen. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. I see. Uh, I see our MC for for the conference is back, back on the screen. So that means uh, we're we're done. But I thank thank all of you for your your time. It's been a, been a great discussion. And thanks thanks the audience for your questions.